Good morning, uh, or I guess, I guess afternoon now. It's uh, whenever I do a presentation in the afternoon, I think it's kind of the start of my day. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, some of the things that we're doing uh, in the city and around the world in terms of uh, disrupting commercial real estate. Uh, my name is uh, Todd Heiser. I am the creative director of Gens Chicago. I lead the office with uh, four other people. Uh, but what I really wanted to talk to you today about is how we're using strategy, analytics, design, and branding to really rethink uh, the commercial real estate market in a four to, I would say, six projects that we're working on throughout the city. So casual discussion. If you have any questions, I'll leave some time at the end and, and we can talk. Um, the, the thing that I want to talk to you about today is really kind of three components. Uh, how does an existing building recapitalize ourself, itself? So we're working on a series of buildings throughout the city, really the country, that we really talk about kind of recapitalization. How does a new building shape perception? How do we actually create districts and cities? I'm going to show you an example of Sh in, in Shanghai where we actually recreated a district through a 128-story building. And then how might a future building act? So we're going to jump to actually a project that I'm working on in Sunnyvale, California for NVIDIA, a tech company, to think about how uh, even in a uh, suburban Bay Area setting can we really rethink what a, uh, a commercial real estate looks like. Um, so let's just kind of kick it off. Um, I apologize that you can't see this. Hopefully, can you see, can you see this out there if you squint? Uh, so this is a project in the West Loop for uh, Sterling Bay. It's actually a project that's pretty interesting because the, uh, the, the, the bones of the building were actually uh, you know, a, a previous headquarters and so it lay vacant for many years. And we went into this project to actually start to look at how could we recapitalize an asset that already existed in the West Loop. Uh, we really thought about how do you capture something like an alley how do you actually make an entrance off of the center of a building and the side of a building and create a unique asset for art uh, within the space? How do you create a commercial real estate uh, you know, investment that isn't just about office space? And this is a really interesting district. I'm sure many of you are from Chicago. You, you know actually that neighborhood. Google moving there has really kind of spawned development. We've been working there for a long time. We're working on several projects uh, in that area. Um, this is a project that you might know. We only have 15 minutes today, so I'm going to zoom through these really quickly. I invite any of you to contact us. We're just on State and Madison if you want to talk about any of these in detail. This is a project that you know. It actually spans the uh, Congress Parkway. It's actually the old post office. And uh, for as long as I've been working at Gensler, uh, 16 years, uh, we've been working on this project, uh, trying to see something happen with this. And now something is actually happening with it. It's uh, 2.5 million square feet of Class A office uh, space. It's actually 250,000 square foot floor plates. Uh, and much like uh, some of the projects that I worked on at uh, the Merchandise Mart, 1871, Matter, uh, Motorola Mobility, when they were in that space, this project actually has some really nice features that the Merchandise Mart also has. Uh, and we're doing some really interesting things. I think what you're, what you're seeing actually in this, in this project is actually a pretty dynamic streetscape that actually connects to the river and combines retail and hospitality and commercial real estate to create a really interesting district that ties to the city in a way that I don't think we've seen before. Um, so how does a new building shape perception? So another project that I've been working on for the last two years, the Sears Tower, the Willis Tower, as you know it, with Blackstone, um, how do you unlock a billion dollars in value or hidden value um, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in an iconic skyscraper? We really actually have to think about creating a destination. And what we did in this project is we actually started to think about who are the users. We have a unique capability as a firm with 50 offices around the world to really think about those users. From a hospitality, I say a lot, everything is a hospitality project and everything is a tech project now. But what we did is we really kind of catalyzed the notion of office workers, tourists and residents to really try to understand what would the sweet spot be for the Willis Tower. And working with Blackstone and EOP, we were able to kind of come up with a really interesting point of view to rethink that entire asset. And really, it's flagship retail, it's a marketplace, it's a food court, it's quick serve, it's a bar, it's juice, it's roof deck, it's all of those things that I think are probably uh, common terms for you guys in this room. 
really office buildings are moving uh, into mixed use buildings. And where we actually talked about urban flight when Willis Tower was built, we're talking about urban renewal. Single use uh, is turning into a diverse program. Protective is actually turning into welcoming. I think we, we all saw at September 11th our buildings kind of turn uh, their face onto the street, a whole series of layers and layers of security, but now we're actually introducing that welcoming component again. Independent is now interconnected, and hardscape is actually now softscape. Um, and I think this is actually a, a picture of the building, what we're planning. So you're going to see the whole tower really open up, which is quite a change from the uh, renovation that occurred in the 90s for that building. We actually have to start to think about a dynamic city. And when we think about our city, we think about all these components, living, dining, shopping, business, culture and entertainment, and parks and open spaces. This is the way that we think about a city block, much like the city block that surrounds us. But when we actually have to get dynamic and think about this in a high rise, we actually start to think about these as a vertical city. And we actually, uh, several years ago, finished the Shanghai Tower, a 128-story building in Shanghai. And what we started to think about is how, through that tower, can we actually create a vertical city? Um, and this actually really kind of redefined the Pudong in Shanghai. And it actually took a series of sky gardens up into the city and moved uh, you know, program really throughout that. So it wasn't a typical mixed use building where it was very stratified. It was actually a, a mixed kind of experience. <clears throat> so how might a future building act? We really think that the office building of the future has four big components. It's an innovation accelerator, a community integrator, a brand beacon, and a cultural touchstone. So some of the things kind of in each of these are obviously as an innovation accelerator, uh, it can actually promote hyper collaboration, connectivity, a mobility platform, and it certainly has a number of technology enhancements that again, this is a major part of what we do. It's a community integrator. So it's pedestrian oriented, it's walkable, it's close to transit, amenity, amenity rich, and it actually is built uh, with indigenous materials. It, of course, actually uh, incorporates all of the components of sustainability and well. A brand beacon. Many companies are looking for this building that is actually an icon, right? We see it actually in an Apple store not far from here in a retail space. But people are looking that buildings actually speak their brand. It creates a sense of pride and ownership. And finally, a cultural touchstone. So we think these buildings need to have a notion of authenticity, an engaged workforce, and a recruitment tool that actually promotes creativity. I think that's one of the main drivers that we're seeing in the Fulton Market District over in the West Loop of Chicago. So the office building of the future uh, really has a series of touch points. It's expandable, flexible, and adaptable. It's a building with heart and soul. It has volume and vertical connectivity. It has a personal entry, a front door. We see this in retail, hospitality, and uh, commercial office buildings. We want the building to have intelligent building skins. We're going to show you, or I'm going to show you, actually, a project uh, for PNC that the entire skin of the high rise actually breathes. It has personal amenities. It's connected to the community. It's building tenant brand and identity. And of course, it has corporate social responsibility. And finally, larger varied floor plates. One amazing thing about uh, the old post office that we're doing is actually floors are not on the same level. So that 250,000 square feet, they actually have varying levels. And that's actually seen as a benefit for the loft-like space, right? As, as a designer, spending you know, more than 20 years in my career, we always tried to do things with the floor and actually play with the planes. Uh, now there's actually a lot of existing uh, you know, assets that actually have this. This is actually the project that I was talking about for NVIDIA. The building on the bottom side of the screen was just completed two months ago. We're actually starting construction. But the notion behind this is that we actually uh, created for NVIDIA a typical floor plate. But then we actually started to understand what happens if we rotate this typical floor plate and then connect that with a central atrium and then finally create cross connections uh, through a collaborative central heart space. And this is much like you would have seen an atrium in a, uh, you know, an old hospitality project. I always tease people that say it's like an old uh, Embassy Suites hotel, right? And that's actually coming to the world of uh, workplace. And the notion behind that is accelerating serendipity. So our corporate clients have realized that actually instead of a series of pancakes, they can use those kind of cross connections to really enhance their productivity. Um, and so we really decided to give this building a heart 
to really create a series of work plates that then could incorporate socialization and collaboration in the center and really optimizing those connections. We did a really interesting study that I don't have time to show you today. We used a program called Grasshopper that actually identified these cross connections that workers could save time, which to the founder, Jensen, of NVIDIA was really an interesting thing. So our tools actually allow us to communicate to office workers the pluses and minuses of, of a building kind of as how you move through it. And this is actually the density of the floor plates. So you can see a really dynamic space. Uh, each building is about 1.5 million square feet of uh, you know, office users. Um, as we actually think about this project, we went through a really interesting uh, study in daylight. How do we actually maximize daylight to make sure we use that atrium to, instead of just creating four sides of the building, actually create a complex shape that you could actually uh, encompass daylight on six sides of the building and actually use that daylight to make sure there was no bad seat in the house. And we did that actually through, uh, you know, obviously using some modeling tools. Um, this is actually a project for PNC Tower in Pittsburgh. And one thing I wanted to kind of uh, point out today is that these buildings aren't just happening in Chicago. We're seeing them in Columbus. We're seeing them in Schaumburg. We're seeing them in a lot of places across the United States, Kansas City, uh, St. Louis. And one interesting thing about this, a company like PNC Bank is really starting to think about how can they do well by a city. And so the notion of sustainability and well is a really important component in the buildings that we actually do. This entire uh, skin uh, breathes and it actually 91 percent of the floor plate can be naturally lit. So the entire uh, perimeter of the facade is actually a movable facade. Uh, it actually has a solar chimney and you can actually see how we orient this. The floor plan is very non-traditional planning. So we're really kind of out of the box disrupting what you might see in a normal workplace, which is something that seems logical based on what we're seeing from WeWork and co-working spaces, right? Nothing is common anymore. We're really seeing uh, that whole notion of what is common uh, really be uncommon. And we can really start to show you actually the ability for this building to actually pull fresh air in from the outside and deal with, you know, 15, 20 floors up natural ventilation, um, which a lot of the users of this project really like. Um, and this actually shows you a, uh, you know, a final photo of that project. Um, we use data-driven design and intelligent building skins on projects to actually define those facades. And we use it actually to disrupt the way design would normally happen. It can affect views, climate, program, aperture, screen, and articulation. And in this project in Cincinnati for 84.51, which was previously done Humby, we looked at all of these things to create a facade that would optimize the views in a dense urban location. But one more interesting thing about this, you'll see an article come out in the New York Times this week about it. What we planned actually for this project is that the building owners can actually move down into the parking garage with minimal uh, changes to the building and actually make those occupiable floors as they need less parking and Cincinnati adopts light rail. Um, and so Grasshopper script was used to translate data into an optimized module curtain wall. And so what it does is it actually, uh, we, we use uh, BIM modeling to actually uh, stimulate all the views uh, throughout the city. It's pretty interesting because the facade is actually a much different process in designing that. It's very data driven as opposed to just aesthetically driven. Um, and this is actually the, uh, the notion of this building. One interesting thing I would, I would point out that the second, third, and fourth floors that you're seeing are actually parking floors. And you can start to see maybe if you squint, some of the divots in the uh, ceiling actually are this interconnected canyon that cuts through the building that actually ties the building together. So as they actually think about moving through those uh, floors, it's easier than actually, uh, you know, they don't have to add an entire curtain wall to the exterior of the building. But this actually requires a lot of pre-planning to think about what should those ceiling heights be? How should we accommodate for technology and HVAC? And, and, and what does the streetscape look like? Which is actually an entire retail podium throughout the space. Um, and this actually shows you that canyon on the floors that they occupy. They're actually starting out by occupying five of those floors, nine through uh, four, and then the lower floors are parking.
So again, really quick, uh, you know, kind of run through about uh, six projects that actually talk about how we're really thinking about commercial real estate and disrupting things that you would think as uh, common buildings from three points of view, really existing buildings, new buildings, and then assets that are actually quite a bit older that we really need to rethink. So. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about these. I know it's a pretty quick time to talk about uh, some, some pretty uh, involved projects, but, but happy to do that uh, in, in the next five minutes. Yeah? Has the renovation process started on the post office? So the renovation process has started on the post office. I have to say, from a designer's point of view, that was one of the most amazing uh, projects to walk through because uh, there are parts of the post office that when they, uh, you know, when they left that space, there are just, it's an amazing thing. You would actually have, you know, postal trucks that were actually still in the building. But the lobby is actually completely done, and it's really exceptional. Um, if you have a chance to actually go in that space, I know uh, the people working on that project uh, really want to kind of unveil it in the appropriate way, but it's a spectacular development. And uh, there's a lot of work left to be done, uh, but it is underway. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah sure. Ah, good question. So that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, that is that is a question that I can't answer. I know uh, I, I, I'd love to be able to tell you I spent um, probably three or four years of my life working with uh, Santiago Calatrava on that Spire site. Um, there have been a lot of really amazing proposals. We actually uh, we actually developed, uh, I would say, an internal competition in our firm to really think about what that site could be. But um, I think your guess is really as good as mine on that one. Uh, but there have been a lot of, I think, pretty incredible proposals for that site. Uh, you know, another, I think, a lot of those, uh, I would say, super tall buildings now, most specifically residential and hospitality, are coming online. I've been working uh, with Studio Gang on Wanda, uh, right on Wacker Drive, for uh, three or four years. So uh, I'd love to know. Um, I, I, again, I love that project. I think it would have been a really amazing uh, kind of asset for the city. Any other questions? Great. Well, I would invite you. Uh, our office is actually in the old uh, Carson Perry Scott department store at the corner of uh, Madison and State Street. If you have any questions about these projects, if you'd want to understand kind of more about how we're thinking about space, uh, I'm always happy to sit down with you and uh, talk about some of the things that we're working on. Uh, have a great time at the conference. I think there's some really interesting uh, sessions. <laughs>